sets. We have notes to be able to follow along. So first off, we're gonna go with the 10 steps to home building. So who's here sold a new construction or built a house? I built a house. Built a house? So when you do that, you know they, they gotta go in order. And if they don't go in order, there's problems. Um, <laughs> but what we try to do is to, to check in along the way. So 10 steps to build a new home are A, preparing construction, the site, and the foundation. They do rough in framing. Finding a lot is the first one. Finding a lot is really the first one because they want to. You gotta want to know where you're gonna be, right. and the lots differ, prices differ. Um, and just you know. configuration, depending on what kind of house you want. Right. If you're, you're gonna put a two-story on a fall-off lot, that's weird because you're way high. Um, a lot of those will end up with kind of a reverse one and a half story that kind of bleeds around. Um, a lot of those in Risk Lake. A lot of those in Risk Lake, <laughs> and the idea of that lot is it could be more expensive or cheaper. You know, if you got the skinny little lot and they're gonna go, well, we gotta sell it at some point, but you know, if you got the one that backs to trees and has a view and you can walk to the trail, that's gonna be more expensive. So framing, um, you know, does anybody know what rough in framing is? Mm -hmm. Jerry, what is it? That's the uh, stud stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. Studs, they stud out the house. That's when you first see it and it's like, okay. Skeleton. It's a skeleton of a house. Um, so then they do rough in plumbing, electrical, and HVAC. So this isn't the full set of it. This is putting the foundation in for it. Um, there may very well be, because they need electrical on site. If not, they're running a cord basically over there until there's, and there's like a temporary pole that they do the electrical with. Um, insulation, they have to put that in there. Um, it's important to make our houses nice and energy efficient. Uh, some people do more with this than others. Um, then they're going to put up the drywall, the interior textures, and exterior finishes. So they're going to work on, you know, what kind of siding you're going to have. Um, what does it kind of look like? And we're probably not going to talk about floor plans as much here, but when you get to a change, what you're going to have is a base model. And if they want anything changed, you gotta start it beforehand, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't, then it's hard to get those changes in. They cost money to make those changes. And it costs money. <laughs> and those are what we call change requests. <laughs> and if you're having new construction, you're gonna have change requests. And I will say at this point too, um, every builder usually has their own contract. And not, what we also have here is that we have um, as well the, the setup for people that are going to have their own change requests set up. So that has got to be under these what they're looking for. So you do your drywall, your interior texture, your trim. Um, they do the exterior driveways and walkways. So coming up to the property, now you've got a way to get in before you especially when it's muddy it's kind of a mess to try to get up to those houses you install the hard surface flooring in the countertops you complete the exterior grading to, to make sure that the property is starting to um, be able to to grade off with the water you'll see every once in a while when that foundation is in it'll kind of just puddle in the foundation what do you got I don't know if this is the right place for this but especially for the new people when you're looking up at MLS for houses to show buyers, there are a lot of people that will list new construction and there's not even a hole in the ground. Right, so yes. So make sure you're careful about knowing what's there before you show up with your buyer. Yeah, wouldn't that be fun to show up with your buyer and you're like, okay, oh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no house here. Um, We're not all created equal. That's true. And every once in a while there's not even a there's not even an office because they'll sell the model and the people are gonna go, all right, where am I gonna do this stuff? If you do have a model, you usually have all their floor plans there. You can come in, they're furnished, they look nice, you can see the finishes. So usually that's the place to start um, when you bring them to the subdivision. And you're also gonna have your co-op agent, which I'll put a plug in here for being good co-op agents. The, the people that run the subdivision, the agents that are there all the time know, know all the builders, know what they like, what they dislike, what they can do, what they can't do. So 
that's really a great place to start the process um, when you bring in a buyer. So after that, they're gonna finish the mechanical trims. They're gonna install bathroom fixtures. Um, every once in a while, people don't have bathroom fixtures in their list of things, and you might go, all right, do I need to have towel racks? Do I want an extra towel rack? Some of that stuff. They'll what install, mechanical trims? what's that? What are mechanical trims? Mechanical trims, finish the mechanical trims. So this is the inside. It's registers. Yes, it's the, Thanks. yeah, trying to, to make it look finished, but it's the, the core guts type stuff. Um, mechanical trims can be outlet covers, that, that sort of thing. Um, mirror, shower doors, finish the flooring. A lot of times they've done the flooring, but they don't really want to give it the, the final coat because you got people coming in and out with boots and muddy stuff. So they'll finish that. They'll finish the exterior landscaping, and then you'll have a final walkthrough with the builder. So that is the point where you're going, okay, they, most of the time they're going to bring some blue tape yep. and go here, here's the, here's the spot where we chip the wall. Here's the spot where you, um, we tried the burners and one of the burners doesn't work. And that's the final walkthrough to be able to be fixed. Um, Jim? One of the things I recommend is where the electrical outlets are going to be placed. Mm -hmm. And at the very beginning when they're doing the rough-ins, as well as when things start to get installed, I can get a visual picture of an outlet as to where it is as, as you need it. Mm -hmm. And one of the best examples are bathrooms, master bathrooms. There's an electrical outlet where the switch is. It's six feet long to the other end of the counter. Yeah. There's no outlet down there. Yeah. Uh, just a hair dryer's what six feet long cord. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so maybe. Yeah. I mean, look here. I had to have an outlet up here because I wanted to have the big screen up here. And also the amount of power you need coming in. You know how many amps do you need coming in? Mm -hmm. At one time, because I was in the industry of uh, audio. Mm -hmm. I had a huge sound system, and the power to drive, uh, the power consumption required on that was an entire 20 amp system, separate from everything else. Hot tubs need the same no, no, thing. No. Not that people really do hot tubs. What's that? <laughs> Two hot water heaters. Two hot water heaters. You know, they might even want the the tankless water heater. You know, you're getting new construction. You're probably going to be in there a little bit. That's usually usually the case. All right, so here's our little dump truck. The dump truck's gotta come in and pour the foundation. So you prepare the site first. So you'll hear this term called site prep. Site prep is where they go, okay, we're gonna do this, but we gotta have enough room, we gotta maybe move some trees, any of those things that they need to do. Um, some of those lots you're mentioning in Wrist Lake, if you wanna build a big house on them, they're gonna have to put dirt in there. They might have to bring in dirt to do that, to, to set it up. Um, they're performed by the same crew, <clears throat> but not being the case with a wooded lot. They use a backhoe, bulldozer. They clear the sites of rocks, debris, trees, septic system if needed in the, in the setup. Um, if you're on a rural spot, they level the site, put up wooden forms to serve as a template for the foundation. They dig the holes, the trenches, the footings, um, any structures where the house interface with the earth that supports it are installed in the home. City inspector, and this is inspection one, city inspector has to come look at it and ensure the foundation is up to code and installed correctly. What's that? Many times. Many times. Um, so now you got a hole in the ground and you got a foundation. You put poured concrete foundations. That's what we have here. Um, it's hard to change it after you pour the foundation. One of the caveats on the contract too is if they end uh, if they discover obstructions to digging the hole and putting the foundation, there is extra cost. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to, to go down, most of the time when you have lots, they've explored them um, a bit so that they know if you go down 12 inches and there's a big set of bedrock, that's hard to be able to, to get through. Um, so if the home has a full basement, the hole is dug, footings are formed and poured, Foundation walls are formed. It's slab on grade. People know what slab on grade means? Mm -hmm. It's flat. They just basically, a lot of our, um, like a single family villa might be slab on grade. So once you've done that, um, 
the slab is poured, concrete is poured into the holes in the trenches, it needs time to cure. So you got these things that are called forms that are holding it in place for it to cure. There will be no activity on the site during this time. That's, you shouldn't be touching it because it's all supposed to, they might check on it, but after it's cured, the crew applies a waterproofing membrane to the foundation walls, installs any drain, sewer, water taps, plumbing that needs to go into the first floor slab or basement floor, backfills, excavated dirt into the hole around the foundation. So now they bring the walls, bring the dirt back to the foundation walls. And so then inspection number one, the curing process is complete. City inspector visits the site, make sure the foundation components are up to code, installed properly. It may be a inspection repeated depending on the type of foundation slab crawl. Your builder will then remove the forms and begin coordinating step two, the framing phase. So complete rough end framing. That's the floor systems, also known as the shell or the skeleton of the house. Um, plywood or oriented strand board with OSB sheathing is applied. What is OSB sheathing? Anyone? Pressed wood. What's that? Pressed wood. Pressed wood. It's stuff, it, they put it on the outside to make sure it's waterproofed. Um, OSB sheathing. Apply the exterior walls, roof, windows, interior doors. Um, these are all installed. Sheathing is then covered with a protective barrier known as a house wrap. It prevents liquid from going into the structure while allowing water vapor to escape. Reduces the likelihood of mold and rot. You don't want to have wood rot on your skeleton of the house. So then we get into plumbing, electrical, and HVAC. Um, so completing the rough end plumbing, following items are installed. You've got pipes and wires, sewer lines and vents, water supply, bathtub, shower units, ductwork for HVAC, HVAC vent pipes. After the roofing goes on, the house is considered dried in. So they put the roof on because what happens? Water is supposed to not go in the house. Um, receptacles for outlet lights, switches, wiring table, wiring cables for telephone, um, TV, music systems are installed. So through this, the framing, plumbing, and mechanical systems are inspected, most likely by three different inspectors, because you got to have somebody that's going to know the HVAC, you got to have somebody that's going to know the electrical and you've also got somebody that needs to know the mechanicals of the, the property. Duct work is installed for the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, which we all together call the HVAC, possibly the furnace. Furnace doesn't necessarily go in all the time at this stage, uh, but the pipes are installed throughout. They go through the roof, insulation is installed through <coughs> the floors, the walls, and the ceilings. So after the roofing goes on, the house is considered dried in. Um, we talked about electrician then installs receptacles for outlets. So this is your spot where if you need more receptacles, you want to come look at it. So we just had this building built. Um, and when we started looking at how many outlets you needed in a room, well, when we were going to have three desks in a room, we needed to have outlets basically on every wall because we didn't know what the configuration would be. So good example and it would have been really hard to add in those receptacles later and expensive. So switches, wiring for cable, TV, music systems. Note that the HVAC ducts, plumbing are usually installed before wiring because it's easier to run the wires around pipes and ducts rather than vice versa. Installing insulation. What should you know about insulation first? If you touch it, it's itchy. <laughs> it's not fun under skin. What's that? The blowing kind of insulation, yeah, that happens a lot these days. Um, new construction, what kind of insulation are you guys doing on your properties? Blown in, yeah. Yeah, blown in over the attic. Or over the attic. Over, over the, the attic, garage. over the garage. Yeah. Um, so it plays a key role in creating a more comfortable, consistent indoor environment <coughs> while significantly improving a home's energy efficiency. Common types of insulation, fiberglass, cellulose, foam, mineral wool. Sometimes there are concrete block insulations in there. Um, foam board, insulation, con insulating concrete foams, spray foam, and structural insulated panels. And you'll find that there's a difference in price some here. You know, if you're gonna want the, the spray foam versus fiberglass, you'll, you'll see some difference in price. 
common types of insulation, uh, fiberglass cellulose, depending on the region and climate, builder may also use mineral wool, known as rock wool or swag wool, uh, concrete blocks, sprayed foam, blanket insulation. Blanket insulation is the stuff that comes in the big roll. So you've probably seen that. If you don't have some in your house, it's not a bad thing to put that like over the garage, um, in, the, in your attic. It's typical in new home construction. So for new home construction, usually it's loose blown in. So it's easier to do that, to be able to get it in all the cracks, crannies, all of those places. So another insulation option is liquid foam, which is sprayed, foamed in place, or injected and poured. It costs more than traditional uh, insulation. Liquid foam has twice the R value per inch and can save and fill those smallest cavities. So more expensive, but more efficient. Fiberglass mineral wool baths and rolls are usually installed in the sidewalls. So when you've got the, the framing that's come up, now they, they're bringing it in, you're gonna put this before you put on what? Sheetrock. Sheetrock, drywall, mm -hmm. right. So manufacturers often attach facings such as craft paper, foil craft paper to act as a vapor barrier or as an air barrier uh, in areas where the insulation will be left exposed, such as basement walls. Um, the bats sometimes have a special flame resistant facing. So if there's a fire in the basement, you're not going to catch your insulation on fire. Drywall and exterior finishes. Has anybody hung drywall? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's fun, isn't it? Especially uh -huh. the ceiling. Yeah, ceiling. The walls aren't too bad, right. usually. Right. And then you do that mudding and taping to make sure. I've watched it being done. Yeah? <laughs> Good. Well, um, so drywall is hung and taped. So the seams between the boards aren't visible. And drywall texturing could be applied. Um, primer coat of paint is also applied after taping is complete. So primer. Um, usually the same color. Um, they may do tinted primer sometimes, but usually it's kind of a white primer. So after that's done, contractors begin again installing exterior finishes such as the brick or the stucco on the outside of the property, um, stone and siding. What's most popular these days? Combination kind of? Yeah. With the stucco on the front, stucco on the front with the rock face yeah. maybe. Um, Hardy board. A lot of hardy board, yeah. That's that's nice siding. Um, it stands up to time. You know, you'll see these older houses that they just didn't have hardy board um, being replaced when they're doing renovation these days as well. So next, you finish the interior trim. You install the driveways and the walkways. So interior trim is the doors, the baseboards, the casings, the window sills, any molding that goes in there stair balusters, decorative trim, along with cabinets, vanities, fireplace mantles. Walls get a finishing coat of paint and are wall <laughs> and are wallpapered where applicable. Wallpaper's kind of back. It comes in every once in a while. Um, it's not as common as it used to be, but that's one of the things that also gets installed. So finish, install exterior driveways, interior doors. We talked about some of those. Um, Generally, exterior driveways, walkways are formed at this stage. Many builders prefer to wait until the end of the project before pouring the driveway because some heavy equipment that they might need to have in there, such as like a drywall delivery truck can damage the concrete. Um, it kind of depends. And this is one of those, you gotta check where it's going and what are they gonna do? They're gonna frame it up so you can see what it looks like. Um, it's not a huge amount of thing to change. It might be a amount to change if you get like a third stall area on a two car driveway, but it's really hard to do afterwards or they don't like to do it. Um, so builders pour the driveway as when the foundation is completed on some as well, because that way homeowners can visit the site. It's a lot easier in that way. And they won't get all their shoes muddy because these are work sites and you'll see There'll be builders as well, especially in commercial, that'll go, hey, you gotta wear a hard hat because you're walking around my, my construction mm -hmm. site and I don't want you to get hurt and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna take that risk. So then they're gonna install the hard surface flooring, countertops, complete the exterior grading, uh, ceramic tile, vinyl, wood flooring are installed as well as countertops. Exterior finished grading is completed to do proper drainage away from the home. 
Um, ceramic tile, vinyl, or wood flooring is installed. So you've got a base now. And as I mentioned before, a lot of the wood flooring and stuff, they will, they will finish it, but they're not going to give it the, the full coat finish because you're gonna still have a lot of work happening in the house. Finish the mechanical trims. What are the mechanical <laughs> trims? <laughs> they're light fixtures, outlet switch panels that are installed. The electrical panel is completed. Um, one of the things I've noticed, just a simple tip, make sure they tell you and they label them well what all of the electrical is. Um, you don't want to go in there and be like, I don't know, um, which, which, thing, which thing popped. So the HVAC and equipment is installed, registers are completed and put into the rooms, sinks, toilets, faucets are put in place. So at this time, you're, you're, you're getting pretty close. Um, might talk about timeline kind of at the end of how long this all takes. It kind of depends. The weather changes that as well, but you're getting pretty close to having a, a, a pretty good shell of the house and now it's starting time to polish it up to get those finishes in there. So mirrors, shower doors, carpeting are installed, final cleanup takes place. Um, step number nine, trees, shrubs, grass are planted, other exterior landscaping is completed. So this is another one of those times where you're like, okay, um, if you want a whole bunch of landscaping, um, it can be expensive. Yeah. And a lot of times you'll, you'll have people, they're gonna go through these consults to go through what are my finishes, what are my, my setups that I'm gonna do, and there'll be someone just like that for landscaping. Um, if not, you might get two bushes right in front, and <laughs> you know, it's up to you. Sod, you know, sod's gotta go in there too at some point. Is this, isn't this a place where the landscaping itself and like getting the yard seated, whatever. You could be moving into your home and they're closed on your home and stuff is not done because of weather conditions, etc. Yeah, it's it gets close on this stuff. Sod might be the day before you close on your house sometimes. Um, gotta think about sprinkler systems at this point too. That's another one that <clears throat> pops in there. They go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We went, oh, we, we thought we were getting a sprinkler system. Um, there's some other little things in there that pop into garage doors, garage, door, garage door openers, not, not necessarily garage doors, those might not be standard. Um, so at this point, inspection number five, building code is completed, final inspection, um, and they issue what we call a certificate of, of occupancy. Um, literally, this might not be a certificate. <laughs> it's kind of that they check the box. Um, so once all these are done, the code official completes that final inspection. Any defects found during the inspection, a follow-up might be scheduled. So you're going for the certificate of occupancy, but there's something wrong with the electrical. Well, that's gotta be fixed before they're gonna come, so they might have to have a revisit by the inspector. Final walkthrough. Um, your builder will walk through your home to, to, account, or to acquaint you with its features, operation of all those features, so this is important when you're going, okay, where's the water shut off? You know, what am I gonna need to do if I've got that sprinkler system? Um, if I've got two different hot water heaters, how does the plumbing go through them? Um, various, various components, maintenance, upkeep, they'll cover whatever kind of warranty they do. Uh, most have a builder's warranty. Um, I would say a builder's warranty usually has what we call like a nine or 12 month checkup on it too. So you're gonna go, okay, I'm living in the house. It's a brand new house, so they're not perfect. Um, and so if there's anything, you probably kind of get a honeydew list of things that you'll, you'll figure out that need to be fixed. And they'll come up with those and you'll, you'll try to fix those at nine to 12 months. So various components done, warranty coverage. Um, a couple different slides here. I know we talked about this at a sales meeting not too long ago. What are, what are types of houses? So we'll start with the top one up there, a uh, bungalow. Um, this is a smaller home, it usually has a dormer attic, uh, one or two bedrooms down, um, exterior shingles, front porch a lot of times. Um, that's the bungalow. The Cape Cod is kind of like a bungalow styling, but it's usually got two bedrooms down, it's got uh, a second floor many times with smaller windows. You kind of see the eyes that pop out of the Cape Cod. 
uh, here at the top. Generally, it has a centrally located chimney um, and kind of a cube styling or rectangular styling to the home. The two-story. What's different about a two-story? All the bedrooms are upstairs. Bedrooms are upstairs. Masters upstairs. Mm -hmm. That's the key. You might have another bedroom or something downstairs or in the basement if they do an egress window, but the master and the bedrooms are upstairs. So, and it also has the same square footage on both levels. Um, that is the definition of a two-story. Uh, I was in the, the Prairie Village, Leewood area, where they have a lot of certain restrictions because they're tearing down houses and they want them to look the same. Um, this, we had an architectural review board that I was on. Um, basically, we look at those and go, okay, does it meet what they want? And for example, in one of those subdivisions, they won't allow two stories. So people get inventive. They look at, okay, can we do a one and a half story that gives you almost the same square footage on the second level? Um, maybe the master's not up there too, but those are the, the conditions. So, so if your part of your second story is over the garage, does that still, you know what I'm saying? So you actually have more square footage on the top floor. It could be. Floor. Usually that'll be called the two story because okay. your square footage is bigger. Okay. Um, but yeah, a lot of people put that master over the garage because it's kind of a big space um, open as well. <coughs> so garage level entry on those as well. One and a half story, at least one bedroom on the main level. Um, square footage is less than the upper floor. Bedroom up possibly has dormers and it has a garage level entry. We have a lot of one and a half stories in, in our area here. A lot of them being built as well. Contemporary, um, I don't know that contemporary is one you can choose in the MLS, um, but you'll see them, you'll, you'll, you'll know those. Most of the time they have a very open concept and they have high ceilings. A lot of the times um, you'll have renovations that they open properties up and they're more contemporary. A ranch, anyone? All on one, one level. All on one level, good. The garage is attached at the end of the home usually on a ranch. One of the sides are even kind of in the front sometimes. Um, entry on the side, the back or the front, no stairs in the main living area, um, going upstairs usually. <coughs> so everything on the same level. When you start to look at splits, um, split level can also be called a bi-level. Um, it's a style of home which is floor level. One part of the house is halfway between the, the, the ceiling and the floor. So one of the, the ones that we have here a lot is what we call the split entry. So you walk in and there's stairs going down and there's stairs going up. Um, they are as well with things called a, a side to side split. So a split that goes side to side. Um, this is a little bit of something that you're gonna learn over time, how these, these differences are. Uh, a front to back split is usually three levels separated by short flights of stairs that kind of go up and down. So think of it as a little bit of a zigzag. Um, a true California split consists of three or four levels, living space with the floor level of one part of the house about halfway between the floor and the ceiling of another part. So if you're thinking about those houses where you've got a, an entry and then there's a raised area where you can kind of maybe see back to the, um, to the kitchen and a dining room area. A lot of times that's the, the California split. Any other thoughts, any other big things what we have? A, what is an atrium split? Anyone, help? <laughs> I, I always understood that California was the master was over the garage and then the atrium basically is the same, but but the master's, yeah, the master's not, and that, that could be correct. Um, okay. Yeah, it's- The reverse one and a half. The reverse one and a half is very, very popular these days. Mm -hmm. um, and the reverse one and a half is basically where you got the master on the main, you have bedrooms down, um, a lot of entertaining area down usually. Uh, we didn't hit a raised ranch. Um, raised ranch is, is an entry garage level is down and then your one level living is above it. So there's a lot of raised ranches in this area too. Walk up steps from the garage. Walk up steps from the garage. Mm -hmm. One of the main important things about these usually is where's the laundry. 
Um, <laughs> it's true. You know, if you got the two story, and you got all the bedrooms on the top story, usually you put the laundry on the top story. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is a good example of the different types of roof. Um, you've got a gable roof or a hip roof. They look very similar, um, but what you're going to see on the, the gable roof is just straight down. And you'll see in some properties that there are multiple types of these roofs put together. So there might be a gable over the garage, but then the the main part of the house might have what we call the hip roof where you've got one, two, three, four sides that come down kind of in a, a trapezoid type of a, a setup. We've got the cross gable roof. You can kind of see that it goes one to two. Um, the mansard roof, I don't think we see too many of these here. Um, it's like a barn. Yeah? A few of them are I see on the yeah. So this has kind of got a flat roof on top, and then it's got these sides. So the flat roof is gonna have a different treatment. Um, pyramid hip roof. Pyramid hip roof goes all the way up in a pyramid. Um, and one of the other things that this doesn't necessarily go over is what the pitch is. So the pitch is how steep it is. And <laughs> when you're getting a roof done, if you got a really high pitch, it's gonna be more expensive. Yeah, because it takes takes more time. It takes more skill to be able to put those on. Um, salt box roof. This is kind of like a gable roof, but it's usually one side is longer than the other. Um, the gambrel roof is the one that looks like the um, looks like the barn. Mm -hmm. uh, a flat roof. Anybody know what a flat roof is? <laughs> flat. You don't want them usually. Um, Commercials have flat roofs. Um, a bonnet roof. Bonnet's kind of like the, you put the hip roof on and then you put like an exterior piece to it. A lot of times these are the ones that kind of have a, a porch around the outside of them too. Um, and then there's a shed roof off to the side. What's the other, other important thing about these? Gutters. So you've got to get that water out from the foundation. So they have different types of guttering systems. You'll have those pieces that cut up, which would be like a flow. So it comes down one of these gables here, and then it tries to flow water back into the gutter onto the left side or the right side. Those are also places that a lot of times get, what? Wood rot. They, they truly are, and a lot of that is usually because of sheeting and how they do the, the splash guard with metal to keep it away from the, the house. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all this. Um, <laughs> I can't. Um, but if you look at stuff like the brick chimney, you'll find out where that is. Um, it has some stuff about where the rafters are, the vents, um, windows, different types of siding. So over here, you see the circle over here? This is a gable vent. So you're gonna to wanna to have that venting to be able to get some air into your attic. Um, and the, the roof type also has the, the different types of venting you'll need. Um, drip edge, might need, need one of those. Skylights, skylights go in. Um, there's some of those places that do kind of that, that sky tube, if you will. The light tube. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's sort of an aftermarket thing. Right? It is a lot of aftermarket stuff. Yeah. Um, but if you've got a, a dark room, yeah. you don't really have windows or maybe a hallway that's long, sometimes those are a good way to, to get yeah. some natural light in there. Okay, so this is another one I'm not going to go through everything, but these are different types of trusses. Um, does everybody understand where a truss is put? Speak. Yeah, the roof. Yes. Um, so trusses go in the roof, um, multiple piece, half hip, dual hip. Um, they're just ways that you're supporting the roof. And the one of the things that we see in different types of houses is they will build trusses or there's manufactured trusses. Um, other types of parts of the country, I know that manufactured trusses are all they use. Um, here, I think we get a, a mix of it. Yeah, 
most probably more built trusses at this point, but the others are growing and as a way to try to combat some of these costs um, because costs have gone up a lot in labor. But also where you're living in the country. Mm -hmm. you know, if you got high, high snowfall, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to use the same trussing you're using down in Texas. No. You put a different type of roof on there, you put a heavy tile roof on mm -hmm. one of these places, you're going to have to have some more support than you would with a with a traditional one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the villas have oh, yeah. concrete roofs as well. And the walls. Too. Yeah. So this does go over that, that pitch idea. Um, if you're looking at, the pitch is really the run versus the rise. So if you're looking at a, um, a 12, this example here is a 12.3 or 12.4. So this is more of a flat roof, not as high pitched. When you get into a, a 12, 17, you got 12 inches and 17 inches. So this is where you're, you're really looking <clears throat> tall. Um, so it's just the, the run versus the span and the rise. And the plot plan. Um, so this is where you're looking at, this is lot 192, and it's kind of a strange lot. It's a cul-de-sac lot. You can see probably here, because um, it's on a rounded curve. It might be a curve where you've got, you're going around a corner, but, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the front. It's showing in here where the driveway is. It's showing what it has for the main garage area, the main part of what the, the house will be. It's got a front porch on it, a deck on the back. Um, a lot of figures and numbers are on the outside because, what? Easements. Easements, yeah. What you need to do and comply with either the homeowners association or the cities and, and communities. So they don't want you to build outside of X, basically. They don't want you to build right up to your neighbor's spot. Um, and if you have someone that builds over this, it's kind of a big deal. Um, I've seen I've seen decks ripped off um, for the same portion because the deck went over the, the course. This is like as well when you're thinking about building permits for a renovation or an addition, um, you're going to need to make sure that you go within the lines here. And so this spot right here, it's kind of on an angle, but there's a 37 foot spot between. So if they say that you have to be 40 feet, you're gonna have to reduce this deck by three feet to be able to make it work. Uh, one of the other things that I see in some other uh, areas is the amount of coverage of the property versus the lot size. Um, this is specifically some areas that might not be completely brand new construction where you have enough room around, but um, you can't go above X because they don't want the property to be all the house. They're, they're looking for a little bit of, of space between the sides. Here, for example, you're looking at 15 feet. So we probably have a, yeah, we have a five foot easement here. You can't build between that. So now we're talking about 10 feet between the property. Any questions about the plot plan? <clears throat> 